Hey, good afternoon, buenas tardes. How y'all doing? It's great to see you here today, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Padron, for your uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, in case you haven't figured out, uh, he's got game, okay? Did you hear him say how many people are at Miami-Dade Community College? I mean, it wasn't 20,000, it wasn't 40,000. It's, it, I mean, that 160-something thousand people is remarkable. And I spent some time with him down there, and everywhere I go, you would talk to the CEO of this place or that place. And invariably, they would say, oh, he went through Miami-Dade. She went through Miami-Dade. Uh, that institution that he has remarkably built is the gateway to prosperity for so many people, including immigrants, including um, people of color. And so I want to say thank you. It's, it's really an honor to be here. And when I think about um, Opportunity Nation, and I, I think about places like um, Miami-Dade, I look out in this audience and I see the remarkable milieu of people. I'll tell you one thing that uh, comes to mind for me. Uh, I feel pretty confident saying, we got this, okay? Because that's been your theme and I think that's right. And, and when I think about uh, Opportunity Nation, uh, I can't help but think about my own uh, challenges in life and the opportunities that were given to me. I have these prepared notes, but sometimes I wander. And y'all mind? Because you've been listening to people at the lectern. And, and uh, so once in a while, I wander. And the folks with the camera probably aren't too happy about that. But, you know, they can move with you. But, you know, it takes a village. And, and when I think about my own opportunity village, I, I think about uh, the opportunities I had. My, my family emigrated here from the Dominican Republic. I Dominicanos in La Casa. I want to be Dominicanos in La Casa, okay? We're about to celebrate Independence Day tomorrow, 27 de Febrero. And uh, my grandfather was um, the ambassador to the U.S. And uh, after the massacre of the Haitians in the 30s, he spoke out. And... Uh, and so he got kicked out, Nangrata, came to the States. And um, my folks settled in Buffalo. I'm the youngest of five. They settled in Buffalo because the weather was very similar to DR. And uh, <laughs> so they ended up going there. And, uh, you know, my parents, Opportunity Nation meant um, educational opportunity. That's the quintessential immigrant story, education, education, education. And my dad literally worked himself to an early grave. Um, trying to make sure that his kids had access to a quality education. And I was 12 when my dad died. And um, a few months before my dad died, my mom had been real sick. And if you had said to our family uh, January 1st, 1974, that one of your parents was going to die, um, you know, uh, we would have all said it would have been my mother because she had some pretty serious illness. And, and then after my dad died, my mom got sick again. So one of the things I hated uh, and continue to hate is at the beginning of school years when someone asks, what did you do an essay on what you did on your summer vacation? Because for me, I remember that essay. And you know, like, uh, I, I, it wasn't a very fun summer. Let's just put it that way. And, and I bring this up because I had a remarkable village um, in terms of my older siblings. I'm the youngest of five. I had a mother who recovered, and she was able to live another uh, 30 years or so. I had remarkable uh, friends whose dads and moms would you know, take me under their wing. I had a surrogate father who, uh, even though he had maybe a ninth or 10th grade education, was the wisest man I met. And, and they taught me so much. And, and I think that Opportunity Nation is really about making sure that everybody has that village. And in the work that I do, I have learned so much and, 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 and the one thing that I have learned, first and foremost, is that every person is gifted and talented. And it's up to us to draw out those gifts and talents. And, and the other thing I learned is that everyone makes mistakes. And we are a nation of second chances. And the third thing I've learned is that when we work together, we accomplish so much more than when we go at each other. And, and those simple premises have really um, animated 
what I have done. I remember those jobs. You know, I, I had a paper route. I actually had three paper routes as a teenager. I, I picked up golf balls at a driving range. I worked at Sears. I worked on the back of a trash truck. I learned the benefit and value of hard work. You know, 8 o'clock, if you're showing up at 8, 8 is not 8-ish. Eight is eight, okay? Eight means 745. It doesn't mean eight-ish. You know, tempo latino, we sometimes call it. Tempo latino does not work in the workplace. Okay, folks? Eight o'clock means eight o'clock. And those experiences, and, and, and this guy I never met named Claiborne Pell, who gave us Pell Grants, you know, that was part of my village. And my village enabled my siblings and I to have access to that education superhighway that allowed us uh, to realize our highest and best dreams because there were folks saying, you are gifted and talented. And when you screw up, you know what? We're going to learn from it. We're not going to make that same mistake twice. We're going to make new mistakes. Uh, but there were folks who did that for me. And, and, and every day in the job I have now, and, I, and with no disrespect to Lou Gehrig, I feel like the luckiest person on the face of the earth because the Department of Labor is the Department of Opportunity. Through the work that we do day in and day out, we expand opportunity for people to punch their ticket to the middle class. We get to work with the likes of Dr. Padron. We get to work with businesses across this country. And guess what? I got good news for y'all. We are in an economy that has a serious tailwind right now. We've had 59 consecutive months of private sector job growth to the tune of almost 12 million jobs. You know, there were seven job seekers. Seven, count them, seven job seekers uh, for every job opening during the depths of the Great Recession. Now there are less than two. You know, if you're working on an assembly line, you're working 42 hours a week, overtime every week. We got the wind at our back. We've got opportunity. But you know what? I told you, you know, everyone is gifted and talented. Everyone makes mistakes. And you know what? We've got to make sure. And this is the third thing that I learned in my life. Opportunity should never be a function of your zip code. Opportunity should never be a function of the color of your skin or the religion that you worship or the person that you love or your gender. Opportunity should be available to everyone. And that is what we do at the Department of Labor. And that is what the linchpin is of this president's agenda. And that is why, you know, I refer to us as Match.com, okay? You know, we match job seekers who want to punch their ticket to the middle class with businesses who want to grow. And you know what the secret sauce is? People like Dr. Padron. Because you know what? The secret sauce is often getting you into those training programs so that you can understand what the demand jobs are of tomorrow and be trained not only with the competencies to succeed tomorrow and today, but years from now. I was talking to someone in the IT world who was saying how we need to train more people in the cloud. But we also have to recognize that, you know what? The cloud is today's technology and 10 years from now, or some period from now, the cloud's going to feel like the abacus. And so you've got to train people for the competencies to succeed today and the critical thinking to adjust to tomorrow. And that's what we're all about. That's why the president is investing in skills. That's why we have an upskilling initiative where we are taking people and giving career pathways so that you can realize your highest and best dreams. I think you heard from Michael Nutter, the mayor of Philadelphia, um, a wonderful guy. And I was with him a few months ago. We were announcing a $100 million uh, apprenticeship opportunity. You know, apprenticeship is this concept. If you go to Germany, we wouldn't be having a conversation about youth unemployment because Germany's youth unemployment rate is less than half of ours. And why is that? There are a number of reasons. But you know what? When you're 14, 15, or 16 years old, and you're, in this, you're at that fork in the road, you can either go to four-year higher ed, you can go the apprenticeship route. Both are higher ed. Bless you over there. <laughs> and bless all of you 
I don't want to just single you out. How you, how you doing back there? That table 70? Bless your whole table and bless everyone else. But you go. And you know what? When you're in Germany, each pathway has equal stature. And you know what? That's because they understand that there are multiple pathways to the middle class. They understand better than we do that, you know, different people learn differently. Some people are on that linear path. Other folks learn by doing. And we've got to create and accept models that acknowledge all of that. You all know that. And that's why I was with Michael Nutter, because we were in Philadelphia. And you know what we're doing in apprenticeship? We're taking an apprenticeship and we're applying it to IT and cybersecurity and healthcare and logistics. And, and, and you know, one thing I learned about, I got two teenage kids and a 12 year old, okay? 18, 16, and 12. One thing I've learned from my kids is young people love gadgets, okay? And, you know, you got to peel that phone off of them, you know? Focus. How many parents are having that trouble? Focus, okay? I'm not, I can't be the only one. And, and, and the point of this is, so what they're doing in the Philadelphia public school system is providing pathways into middle class IT careers for 18 and 19 year olds. They're on, the, they're on that um, skill superhighway. And apprenticeship is about earning while you learn. Apprenticeship is the other college, except without the debt. And that is why what we're doing is promoting these alternative pathways that have the same destination, the middle class, good jobs, and good opportunity. Because an opportunity nation recognizes that we have to understand that different people learn differently. And we need to take ideas from other countries. We used to value apprenticeship here, but then we, we, we let it go over the course of decades. And now the president is lifting it up again. And that's part of our career pathway initiative. We had a bill that passed Congress in an overwhelmingly bipartisan fashion last year, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And that is another opportunity to create a better opportunity nation. Not a heck of a lot happening on a bipartisan basis in Washington. I'm glad you were all sitting when I said that. But this was one. This was a notable and wonderful exception. And, and we're enforcing that. And what it does is it's giving you more opportunities and the investment in young people, giving us more opportunities to do things differently and better, to serve more in more meaningful ways. And our investment in summer jobs is another opportunity to create opportunity for you. Because not only does summer jobs put money in your pocket, but it teaches you those critical skills. Does someone ever use the word, this is my least favorite term in the English language, the term soft skills. The skills of showing up on time, learning how to work with a team, learning how to play well with others, and learning how to get things done are anything but soft. They are the, these are the essential skills. And that's what summer jobs do. They give you those opportunities to hone your essential skills in addition to the skills of STEM and other things. And that's the investments that we're making. And so many mayors across this country, including Mayor Nutter, including um, the mayor of Louisville, I was with him recently, so many, uh, Mayor Ed Murray of Seattle, if there's anyone out there, I could name dozens of mayors who have stepped to the plate to invest in all of you because you want those opportunities. And then we also need to invest in opportunities in our schools so that you can move forward and have the range of possibilities. And let me give you one example. I was in Toledo with um, Secretary Duncan recently, and we went to this Toledo Academy. I met a woman named Alexis, and she blew me away, 18-year-old senior. You know, she is on a glide path. She wants to, she wants to invent um, MRI machines that uh, help people who are claustrophobic. And as somebody who has been under plenty of MRI machines uh, because I've done stupid things in my life, so I've got replacement parts, I have great respect for Alexis. And, and to see her, she, was, she had access to opportunity here. She got to work with businesses who are involved in this. She got the bug. 
And that's what we have to do a better job of, is helping you with the bug. Helping you to see those opportunities. You go to Sarah Good Academy in Chicago, and you will see a six-year high school program. And you know what these kids are? Sarah Good Academy is almost 100% a minority, almost 100% low, um, low income, and 100% high performing. That's the Sarah Good Academy in Chicago. Their partner agency, uh, their partner business is IBM. These kids, you know, I asked the kid, what did you do last summer? He said, I took geometry. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I need you to talk to my son. <laughs> you know, I can't get him to do that. And, and you know what? Because they had these mentor partners at IBM, they saw the world of possibility. And so everyone I was talking to there was telling me, I asked, what do you want to do? I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a physicist. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I took them aside, tried to talk them out of that. But all the other people I was very enthusiastic with. And I was enthusiastic because, you know what? Every child is gifted and talented. Every child needs a village. Everyone makes mistakes, but everyone should have access to opportunity regardless of their zip code. That's what they're doing in the Sarah Good Academy. That's what they're doing in Toledo. That's what they're doing in communities across the country. That's what you're doing in the work that you do day in and day out. And that's what we're seeking to facilitate through our investments, not only at the Department of Labor, but the Department of Education and across government. That's what Free Community College is about. That's what the President's investments in upskilling are about. That's what our revolution to make sure that everybody has the basic skills to compete from PK to post-grad is all about. Because education is indeed the great equalizer. That's what our investments in reentry are about, because everyone makes mistakes. And you know what? When someone comes out of a correctional facility, the best thing we can do to prevent them from going back in is to give them the skills necessary to compete and a good job to enable them to return to a dignified life. And some of, some of my favorite work that I do and the things I am most proud of have been in that setting. Anyone been to Maryland? The biggest private employer in Maryland is Johns Hopkins. The most prolific employer of former offenders is Johns Hopkins. And if I brought Ron Peterson here, the CEO of Hopkins Hospital, he would speak with great pride about that investment. And he would tell you, number one, this is not an act of charity. This is an act of enlightened self-interest. The former offenders that we employ are of some of our best employees. Low recidivism, high loyalty. He would tell you number two, it is not simply employment at entry levels. They are phlebotomists, they are x-ray techs, they are other allied health professionals, and they are doing a darn good job. And so again, everyone is gifted and talented, and everyone makes mistakes, and everyone deserves a second chance. And that's, those are not simply my thoughts and what my parents taught me, but those are the values of this president. And those are the values he's putting into action. And this is the work that you do day in and day out. Expanding opportunity for young people. This is what My Brother's Keeper is about. Because you know what? In 1950, the, the um, labor force participation rate of young black men was 65.7%. Today, it is something like 36%. Something is wrong with America when we have that data point. And that's something we can do something about by making sure, as I said before, that opportunity is never a function of zip code, or never a function of the color of your skin, but always a function of your willingness to work hard and play by the rules. I am so grateful to this partnership, and the reason I was so excited to speak here is because Opportunity Nation, and as you look at this montage, Opportunity Nation is a joint venture between our business community, our educators, our grassroots activists, our, our, our parents, our schools, at every level, 
our, our, our elected officials, our appointed officials, we're all in this. Because you know, America works best when we feel the full team. And the reality is we have a wind at our back. But there's still too many people who need to get into the game, who wanted to get into the game, but lack the requisite opportunity to get into the game. I didn't say lack the requisite skill because everybody is gifted and talented. And we need to translate the wind that's at our back into opportunity for everyone. What you are doing here, and I say thank you, whether your perch is the US Chamber, whether your perch is a labor union, whether your perch is a school, whether your perch is a nonprofit, whether your perch is a faith community, whether your perch is that of a parent or any other perch. We are indeed all in this together. You know, my, my parents taught me if you want to get to heaven, you got to have letters of reference from poor people. And you know what? I think your parents taught you the same thing. When we expand opportunity for everyone, we build a virtuous cycle. And I'm, I'm telling you, and I leave you with this, the good news is opportunity does abound across this country. We've just gotten through the worst recession of our lifetimes. We have the wind at our back, but we need to make sure that that wind at our back translates into shared prosperity. Because a recovery that benefits only a few, but continues to leave too many people behind, that's not, that's not a recovery that reflects our values as a nation. That's what opportunity is about in the US. That's what this president is about, making sure that everybody who works hard and plays by the rules can punch their ticket to the middle class. So I, I leave you with an ask, okay? Because, you know, I mentioned the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. That was a rare bipartisan moment. We need to create more bipartisan moments across America. And so what I need from you is your help. I need your help in the following task. We need to build a movement. We need to build a movement around Opportunity Nation. A movement that says, as we've discussed, that everyone is gifted and talented, that zip code should never determine destiny, that everyone makes mistakes, and we need to believe in second chances, that businesses want to grow here, not somewhere else, and we need to provide them that skilled talent pool, that young people are our future. You know, in, in, in the state of Wisconsin, I was there recently. I got married there, I spent a lot of time there. I met with advanced manufacturers, talking about the future workforce challenges. The average age of someone in the skilled trades in Wisconsin is 59 years old. The grain of the population, you know, the average age of a Latino in Wisconsin is 18. So we know where the future is. The future is Latinos there. The future is African Americans in Milwaukee. And we need to make sure that as we talk about that, that opportunity for everyone is indeed a reality. And we can't do that unless we build a movement. You know, I'm a civil rights lawyer at my core. And the March on Washington was a march for labor rights and a march for civil rights. I'm gonna be in Selma in a week and a half celebrating John Lewis and Dr. King's heroism and so many others many of whom we know their names, so many others uh, we don't, but are equally heroic. And, and, and that's a time for reflection. And the reflection that I again leave you with is, if we can't build this movement, and, and you are a powerful set of folks out here, and, and we need you to keep coming to Washington to say to your legislators, you know what, I know about austerity, but you know what, when you invest in apprenticeship, every dollar you invest in apprenticeship, we get a $27 return on investment. If you want to run the country like a business, then one thing that business, one of the many things businesses do well is they invest in their human capital. And they leave no one behind. And so let's treat government like a business. Let's invest in our human capital. Let's invest in our young people. Let's give them opportunity. Let's redouble our efforts in apprenticeship. Let's redouble our efforts in summer jobs. And that is how we build a truly sustainable recovery that results in prosperity for everyone.
Now, I probably got some notes back there that I was supposed to say, <laughs> but I sometimes have difficulty reading off of pages, so I'd rather have a chat with y'all. So I hope you don't mind that I didn't read from my notes, and I want to say thank you for everything that you're doing. <laughs>